introduction before I turn it over to um, Mike and Kurt and Mark. But I am uh, Hannah Anderson. I'm the Wildlife Diversity Division Manager here at Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I'm really excited that we're having um, such great participation today. Um, we're here to learn about Shrub Step. And um, with us today are three of um, my colleagues here at WDFW. I'm really pleased that our um, vegetation ecologist, Kurt Merg, is with us. And I think he's going to launch us off. And then we'll hear from Mike Schroeder, a research scientist with uh, expertise in grouse. And then we'll, I think, Mark Teske, our conservation planner with expertise in shrub step, is going to wrap us up. Um, I wanted to give you uh, just that we are recording the event and so we'll hope to be able to share the link with others if we do hit the capacity place um, and also at the end of their their um, presentations i will um, manage a little q a i'll do my best to manage a q a um, so please raise your hand um, and when i mean that the virtual hand right Right there, you've got a tool to be able to put the little hand up, or you can put a question in the chat and I'll try to manage those things. And then finally, please mute yourself. I see most people are, but please mute yourself um, so that we just don't have the, the background um, noise. And I'm really pleased. And also just to give you a sense for the audience here, um, I know we have DFW um, colleagues. We have our colleagues from DNR with us. I saw multiple um, Wildlife Diversity Advisory Council members. I see our Conservation Northwest um, colleagues, Audubon colleagues. Um, so I think we've got a, a really nice, um, I, I know there are members of the public that are with us. And so I'm really pleased and happy to have you all here. That was more than 20 seconds. I'll stop <laughs> and pass it to Kurt. OK, thanks, Anna. Let me share my screen here. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Seeing that? We see your presenter view, Kurt. Oh, you do? Hmm. Not so great. Uh, let me see. How do I fix that? If you un unshare and then yeah. Yeah. Okay, share again. Try that. How's that? <laughs> it's the same view, but you can, um, if you want to just close the format background side and make that part bigger, that can work too. Oh boy. So, we tried this yesterday and I, it didn't work like this, so. I heard, I heard that you went through a great trial run and everything was super and it's just, of course, that's just the way of the world. You, and this you is can just hit the X in the top uh, corner of the format background to close that one window. And then at the very bottom, along the very bottom line, there's a little slideshow button. You can hit the slideshow. Yeah, I don't see what you're talking about, Hannah. This is not working like it did. Um, share screen. Uh, yeah. Why don't you give it one more whirl? And if if we're we're still admitting people, and so um, it's gonna, you can just make that part a little bit bigger. Kurt, or if you want, you can email that to me and I will share it for you in a second and we can just get started with what you've got. Kurt, Kurt did you press the did you press the presentation button on that or shift F5 or F5 that is? Uh, maybe that's the problem. Hey, How's that? we have a winner. Woo. Thanks, that's Mike. <laughs> no problem. All right, long delay there. I won't waste any time. I'll get right start, started. Thanks, Hannah, for the introduction. And thanks all of you for the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite topics. Um, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so we'll start with that. But I did gin up a few words as a definition for shrub step for the purposes of this presentation. And we'll call it an arid grassland with a robust shrub component. And I'll pick those words away uh, apart just a, just a little bit. You know, arid grassland implies that it's dry enough that it largely excludes trees, although not without exception. 
And I want to focus on the robust shrub component, which is also variable. In this picture, we see a roughly equal mix of shrubs and non-shrubs in the, in the vegetative community in the foreground. Um, but that shrub component varies dramatically from just a few shrubs dotting the landscape of uh, non-shrubs to what looks like the sagebrush sea that is dominated by shrub um, plants and and very little less very little else evident at least from a distance although certainly not close up so i put this slide in here to remind me to attribute the source of most of the information that i'll give you today this was a publication written in 1988 after uh a long career of Rex Daubenmeyer, who was a professor at WSU, um, a national class ecologist that focused on steppe habitats in Washington and that wrote this seminal document that's essentially been cited by every shrub steppe researcher since that time. Daubenmeyer described about nine plant climatic zones for the Columbia Basin. And I should, I should have said in a previous slide that the shrub steppe occupies the Columbia Basin and originally covered maybe 24,000 square miles of the Columbia Basin. Um, and here we see the plant zones depicted in that Columbia Basin. And I just want to call your attention to, to some of these shapes because they'll recur in the, in the slides that are coming. So these are plant zones and look at this large polygon here in the central part of the Columbia Basin. And then notice that around it is arranged these other plant communities, these plant commu uh, climatic zones along the periphery. You'll see that same pattern um, in, the, in the next couple of slides, which are all about climate. And this is the first. Um, you know, the Columbia Basin is typified by cool winters and warm summers. And it's, of course, hottest in the lower elevations and gets cooler as you move from these low areas depicted in blue up to the high areas depicted finally in red at these mountain peaks. And you'll see that the, the polygon that I pointed out to you in the foregoing map of plant climatic zones really occupies this area centered on the hot portion of the Columbia Basin. And around it, there are these other plant zones I po pointed out earlier that are arranged in the periphery, which is a more uh, moderate or cooler climate. The same pattern appears in precipitation patterns. The Columbia Basin's in the rain shadow of the Cascade Range. And the driest part of the Columbia Basin is right here in the center, roughly corresponding to that plant zone that I put pointed out earlier. And these other zones in the periphery have increasing precipitation as when one moves eastward or northward or even northwestward uh, from that hot, dry center. Um, and so it, it, that sort of um, emphasizes the, the role that climate has to uh, play in determining the plant communities over the, the broad landscape. But anyone here who has walked through a plant landscape of any kind and notice how plant communities change on a much more local scale realizes that that's not the complete picture by any means. And the first reason for that kind of complexity or local variation in plant communities in the Columbia Basin as many other places has to do with the geological complexity that underlays it. So in the case of the Columbia Basin, I'll give you a rapid geological history that you know starts with multiple lava flows that hardened into multiple layers of basalt here depicted in these sort of coffee brown or light brown areas uh, in the Columbia basin geology map. After that, those layers were covered up by wind-blown deposits known as LUS. And those lasted for quite some time, um, more or less unperturbed by any sort of glacial action, which stopped up here um, to, the, to the north. And so the Columbia Basin was largely unglaciated. It was not, however, sort of exempted from any impact by the glaciers because the when the Glaciers retreated, they loosed the Ice Age floods in several episodes, and those floods flowed from what is now Montana across northern Idaho and into the Columbia Basin, carving these channels into and moving away the lust deposits. 
And then after that period, we had a series of volcanic, of volcanic eruptions that deposited ash, some in, in quite modern times. So that sort of drives the complexity that then gives rise to soil complexity. So as I said, be, or as I implied before, the soils across the Columbia Basin are in general, very generally, deep loam soils. But there are exceptions that are sort of driven by this ge underlying geological complexity. And there are therefore special soils that is exceptional to the deep loams. You know, for example, deep soils dominated by gravel, sand, or ash rather than loam. Or there are shallow so soils that um, occur over those layers of basalt that I talked about. Here's one of those shallow soils right here. Um, with this flowering buckwheat, you know, this pink flowered buckwheat, uh, and a very, very uh, shallow soil that has rock right underneath it. And then here's one of the, the sort of deposits in the, t the mild topography of one of the shrubland er areas that is a sal saline uh, alkali type soil and supports an entirely different plant community. So we see this soil driven, ultimately depending on geology, um, uh, diversification of the plant communities that cover the, the Columbia Basin. And that is compounded by microclimatic complexity of the kind that you can see depicted in this central picture where my dog is laying on a lithosol and is barely con uh, concealed by the really slow um, plants that are, that are growing in that lithosol, which is on the south face of, a, of the hill that she's laying on, and therefore, you know, exposed to direct sunlight, and it's a, quite a dry habitat, which is compounded by the very shallow soils. If you get the dog up and walk back up over the hill um, right behind it and get her to stand in the vegetation community on that side, you'll see on the right-hand picture that the vegetation is much more lush, is composed of an entirely different complement of species, and that contributes to the overall diversity. In addition, you get sort of much more local effects, like, for example, the shade that is afforded by this sagebrush plant in the left-hand photograph, which affords sort of a much uh, relatively moist refuge for a, a variety of forb species and a little bit more lush grasses of the kind that you don't find in the interstitial spaces between the shrubs um, that are scattered throughout this shallow soiled environment. So microclimate in addition to geology and soils, con um, contributes to a diversification of local plant communities that is much more complex than what was depicted by this plant climatic map that Daubenmeyer provided to us uh, so long ago. And this is just an example of that. One local area, in this case, the Hanford National Monument, is um, has its sort of plant community or cover types depicted. Now, some of these are a result of human influence, of course, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But on, but overall, much of this complexity is a result of the kind of diversifying factors that I talked to about after climate, namely geology, soils, microclimate. So that kind of sketches a picture for you of the the original or the aboriginal um, plant communities that made up shrub step in Washington. Variable depending on the climate and variable depending on a variety of uh, uh, complicating factors from geology to microclimate. Now let's take a look at what happened by natural processes and how those affected these uh, this landscape over time. So in Aboriginal times, the natural disturbance and succession of shrub steppe was fairly modest, did not involve uh, a lot of grazing. In fact, our native plants in the shrub steppe area did not evolve with grazers and so are less resilient um, to grazing pressure than other North American grasslands. So the original disturbance was mostly by fire, we think, and, and it was fairly modest at that. And it was followed, those fires, by rapid regeneration of grasses and forbs, which is just another word for wildflowers, essentially. And that was then followed at some distance, maybe a decade or even two, by the shrubs, which are much slower growing. So that was sort of the natural condition in a landscape of shrub step in Washington. Well, after European settlement, that disturbance and succession changed dramatically and in a number of ways. 
So the frequency of fire increased in a way that I'll describe uh, in just a moment, as did the, the scale of it and often in, in current years, certainly. Um, since the middle of the 19th century, shrub step in Washington has been um, pretty heavily uh, utilized by, uh, to, to graze livestock. And that's a sort of a new disturbance pressure, um, as I noted earlier. And then finally, and probably with the most impact of all, we've done a fair amount of cultivation of these deep loamy soils for the sake of agriculture. And concomitant with all this change in the disturbance regime of shrub step, there have been plant introductions as a result of that all that activity. Uh, with European contact came uh, a variety of, of in invasive species, including the winter annual grasses, and chief among them, sort of the poster child for winter annual grasses, uh, is cheat grass or Bromus tectorum. It's an annual grass that invades shrub steppe at the same time that the native plants grow and so competes head to head with native plants for soil and water resources and can prevent them from sort of prevent them from succeeding or coming back after fire and in fact take over the understory of many places. Cheatgrass creates a lot of fuel and is highly susceptible to ignition and so burns more frequently, keeping those shrubs at bay over the long term and effectively converting a lot of shrub step in the worst case scenario to a monoculture of annual grass or cheatgrass. So, you can see that disturbance and succession has changed dramatically with European settlement. And the net effect of that is that we started with 24,000 square miles of shrub steppe, which has become 4,800 square miles of largely degraded shrub steppe, or 20% of the original. And with that introduction, I'll pass the, um, the slideshow over to Mike, and he can talk about uh, the effects or the relationships of shrub step and wildlife. So let's see if I can pull this off a little bit more cleanly than I did in the beginning. So I believe I relinquished the control of the screen. Mike, you're up. Okay. Well, let's see here. Did we do it? Mike, we see your desktop. There's your, there it is. There it is. Okay. okay. Um, um, so there are a lot of species that depend on shrub step. And uh, you can kind of tell when you look at the names of some of these, there's four of these species here that have sage in their names. Uh, they, they didn't get, not get these names accidentally because obviously they depend on this ecosystem or these uh, various types of ecosystems that uh, in which sagebrush plays a fairly major role. Um, not all these species spend all their time in shrub step habitat, but in general, they spend enough time in it that uh, we consider them shrub step obligates. Uh, but like I said, this is these are the vertebrates. So there's a lot of them that are that are not listed here. This gives you kind of a taste of it. The vast majority of these species are declining in abundance, uh, primarily because the underlying habitat is also declining. And most of these species are either listed uh, within the state or listed federally as well. Uh, but there are a lot of species that, you know, you just you can't put them all on a list. And I just wanted to mention one. Sometimes when we think of shrub step obligates, we're kind of thinking of some of those uh, those larger animals, the ones that get most of the attention. Uh, I live in Bridgeport, north central Washington, and one of the species, uh, this one, right here, for example, uh, frequents our garden during the summer. Uh, one of the reasons why it does that is because the caterpillars for this species live on lomatium in the surrounding shrub step. If it wasn't for that lomatium, uh, it's doubtful we would have these swallowtails in our garden. Uh, so when you, uh, Kurt basically talked about some of the variation in shrub step, and I wanted to illustrate it briefly by showing you some of the variation in shrub step that he talked about, you know, you have uh, just looking at sagebrush, for example, the the figure on, or the photo on the left shows where you have a lot of sagebrush and the one on the right, almost no sagebrush. There are five species of sparrows that we've done research on in the, in the uh, Columbia Basin that kind of adjust their uh, willingness to use these areas depending on how much sagebrush is present. 
Uh, the Sagebrush Sparrow, for example, on the far left is one that uses uh, fairly large areas with a dominant overstory of sagebrush, and the Grasshopper Sparrow is on the opposite extreme, going for areas that are almost entirely dominated by grass. Brewer Sparrow, Vesper Sparrow, and Savannah Sparrow are somewhere in the middle. And, uh, uh, and so you can actually... Uh, kind of predict what type of shrub step you have in an area, what the shrub cover is like, just by knowing what the proportion of these uh, sparrow species you might have in a particular site. Um, we actually did some pretty detailed research on this, and one of the things we were interested in was not only how many of these, uh, how these birds were using these particular habitats, but how they were using things like the Conservation Reserve Program, which was a, uh, a set-aside program primarily in, in previously used wheat fields. And uh, those same five sparrows I mentioned are actually on this, uh, this graph here uh, with the addition of the sage thrasher, hornlark, and western meadowlark. Bottom line is, uh, things like the brewer sparrow, sage, uh, well, sage thrasher, obviously, sagebrush sparrow, vesper sparrow tended to like the shrub step areas better because there was more sagebrush. As you got into uh, more grassier habitats, which tended to be more characteristic of the CRP lands, you started to see a lot more grasshopper sparrows and savanna sparrows. Um, there's uh, also been a lot of conversion of this area. I've already alluded to that, and so did Kurt. Uh, two species I wanted to mention, white-tailed jackrabbit and greater sage grouse here, because both of these species, you can, you can find these species regularly in wheat fields if you know when uh, during the day to look for them and where to look for them. But even though you will find sage grouse regularly in a wheat field, uh, to say that they depend on wheat field would be a complete mistake because the only wheat fields where we regularly find uh, either of these species are when they're fairly close to shrub step. And in the previous graph, when I was showing you some of the, uh, the relationships of birds with shrub step, uh, the, the research was actually more complicated than that because one of the variables I didn't show you was landscape context. And landscape context clearly plays a role out here. Uh, even in areas where shrub step has been removed, if you have shrub step close by, you can still get some shrub step obligates using the, uh, using the surrounding region. Uh, there was also a mention of the importance of deep soil. Uh, one of the things that's pretty clear from looking at Kurt's graphs is that most of the deep soil areas uh, within the Columbia Basin of Washington have been removed. And you can kind of tell by which species are listed as to which ones like deep soil. Both the pygmy rabbit and Washington ground squirrel both depend on these deep soil areas because both of them burrow. And uh, uh, the pygmy rabbit is now federally listed as a result. And uh, there's hardly any of that left. Uh, and you can understand why with uh, more than a century of uh, settlement uh, by farmers, most of the uh, deep soil areas were converted so people could grow wheat and other things. Um, there's also some other things, though, that, that we are clearly uh, seeing within the shrub step areas. Lots of different ways you can degrade these areas. This is a DNR uh, piece of ground, uh, fairly decent in size, northeast of uh, Mansfield, the town of Mansfield. And there's a big power line corridor that runs uh, through this uh, piece of land uh, right adjacent to a road. That figure that's on the left actually shows the power lines. The power lines are kind of going from the bottom to the top on that figure. And all of those purple diamonds there represent observations of sage grouse. We actually had some satellite transmitters on these sage grouse so we could actually get fairly regular observations on these birds. Um, the area where we caught the birds was actually off on the uh, east, well, actually south, on the right side of that figure. That's where most of the observations were. Uh, there's fairly continuous habitat throughout that area, but when the birds would occasionally cross the power line and be seen on the other side of the power line, uh, what was pretty obvious is that there was roughly a 500-meter uh, wide stretch represented by that red line there where we rarely saw birds. And even as we got close to that, the number of observations declined substantially. And there was uh, pretty obvious uh, avoidance of power lines. So even though 
the habitat underneath these power lines looks pretty good. Uh, just having the power lines there is going to have an impact on some species. Uh, there was also kind of a mention of, of overgrazing, and I don't want to spend too much time on this because grazing is a pretty complex issue, and what constitutes overgrazing is equally complex. Uh, but one thing is pretty clear. Uh, that previous type of area is not one where you would regularly find nesting sage grouse. And the reason is uh, sage grouse in our area, they like to have uh, a herbaceous component, the herbaceous component being made up of grasses and forbs to provide not only uh, uh, horizontal cover, but vertical cover that helps conceal their nests from potential predators. Uh, this type of cover is very important out here and not just for sage grouse. Um, there's also been a mention of fire, and as you know, the fires in 2020 were pretty devastating on a scale we'd never seen before uh, in the state of Washington, at least. And actually, um, the Labor Day fire that burned through uh, northern parts of Douglas County and southwestern o and south central Okanagan County on the Colville uh, was roughly 400,000 acres in size. It was pretty vast, the largest fire ever observed uh, or recorded in the state of Washington. And you can kind of tell from looking at this, this was this is a DNR piece of land, and this is an area that was re regularly used for, by sage grouse. We're going to find out in the next couple of weeks whether it's still being used by sage grouse. Um, but I was pretty amazed that that one shrub had survived. But this little, uh, the reason why I included this little picture of the uh, western skink is because within seconds of this photo being taken, this skink came out from underneath one of these rocks and was running across the ground. And I'll be honest with you, that's only the second Western skink I've ever seen out there in, in shrub step. And to have it show up right after a fire like that was pretty stunning for me. Um, so, but even even fires uh, have a flip side. There are certain species that respond to fires, although I'll be the first one to admit to you, that depends on the scale of the fire. Um, species like the sharp-tailed grouse, which are shown here, regularly will respond in a positive way, at least in a few year, a couple of years after the fire. Uh, they will respond positively, positively to a fire. And one of the reasons for that is sometimes uh, the grasslands will be rested. Uh, sometimes a fire can actually promote grasses by decreasing the competition with uh, shrubs. And sharp-tailed grouse will sometimes respond positively to that. And they're very good at moving into an area uh, when the habitat improves. However, you have to keep in mind that even with, uh, with a positive response, it often depends on the scale of the fire and the intensity of the, the fire. And fires like we uh, had last year are generally above anything that would be beneficial, at least even on the, the, the long term. Uh, fragmentation is another issue. And uh, one of the things we have in places like uh, northern Washington, where we have a history of glaciation, is that the very rocky soil has precluded conversion of all of the area uh, for the production of things like wheat. And so what you have is you have areas where you're growing wheat surrounded by little fragmented patches of unconverted land that, that support sagebrush and grasses and forbs. And you end up with a landscape that's very mixed up like this. Well, fragmentation in certain ways can actually have a positive effect in that you have, you have habitats that can remain somewhat protected. But on the negative side, you end up with uh, you're, you're sub subjected to stochastic events where if you have a small fragmented area left, the animals that live in those areas or depend on those areas are dependent on sort of random events that can happen, like a serious snowstorm or a wildfire or something else that could destroy that little fragment and make, the, make it uh, unsuitable. You also end up with the uh, with an issue where if you have fragments that are too far apart, you end up with a lack of connectivity and species like uh, sage grouse and sharp-tailed grouse. And gosh, imagine what it's like for a, uh, a small lizard trying to get from one fragment to another. Uh, it can be very difficult. 
And uh, what happens in those cases, even though you might have a species survive in one fragment or another fragment, if they can't uh, remain connected, you can end up with genetic homogeneity or genetic drift showing up within the respective populations. And just to kind of give you a, an illustration of how this plays out in Washington with sage grouse, on the figure there, the red area is the historic range of sage grouse, but those green areas represent the the two core remaining populations of sage grouse in the state of Washington. The northern one's in Douglas County, the southern one is on the Yakima Training Center. And those areas used to be connected, uh, but uh, with the conversion of habitat in the middle and around uh, those areas, they've been uh, disconnected for somewhere in the neighborhood of 80, 90 years uh, and probably getting more disconnected every year. The bottom line is genetically, you could take a you can take a blood sample from a bird in Douglas County and you can tell whether it's from Douglas County or the Yakima Training Center just based on the DNA that's currently in those populations. Those populations have not been separated that long and already the birds have diverged enough that you can tell them apart. Um, so I wanted to finish uh, uh, and talking just about the generality of shrub step, I focused mostly on the obligates uh, for obvious reasons, because these are species that depend on shrub step. But if you're ever out in shrub step areas in the spring and you watch a flock of mountain bluebirds come in and land on uh, on sagebrush plants, these these habitats are very important for a lot of other species that may not depend on shrub step uh, for their livelihoods, but they do depend on shrub step for the open spaces that are provided by it. Um, in other words, sometimes just having an area that's not heavily populated with people, not crisscrossed with tons and tons of roads, uh, is all the difference in the world for some of these species. And whether it's a mountain bluebird or a butterfly, that's kind of an important concept. And so now uh, I believe it is uh, Mark Teske's turn. So. I have to, I have to get out uh, if I can figure out how to do it. Okay, I believe I have. I done it. Am I out? Yeah, you're out, Mike. Uh, so, are like we, folks, seeing uh, an ALI slide? Not yeah. seeing anything yet. There. there we go. All right, there's a lag time. So um, my name is Mark Teske. I'm with Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. I work on shrub step conservation across the state, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the conservation tools um, that have um, been developed. And um, so what's available, really, uh, and also how we're trying to use them. And so it's be a little bit of a drink out of a fire hose, but I'm just making folks aware of, of what's out there and um, how they're being um, employed. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the Arid Lands Initiative, uh, ALI. And um, and uh, we got some shrub step as a background here. But we just want to talk about the vision of, of ALI. And I'm going to read this quickly. A diverse assemblage of public and private and tribal interests working together to conserve and restore a viable, well-connected system of Eastern Washington's arid lands and related freshwater habitats. Uh, sustaining native plant and animal communities and supporting local communities and compatible economic development. And so that was the vision of ALI as uh, looking at um, conserving um, shrub step in this landscape that we find ourselves in. And um, Another shot of shrub step, um, another spring shot, just showing the beauty of it. Um, and the uh, core goal of the spatial analysis that was undertaken was to identify areas in the Columbia Plateau landscape for restoration and protection of current habitat and species distribution. And uh, also having in mind uh, um, the changing climate. And so I'm hearing some uh, background noise, so if somebody could everybody can mute that would be wonderful um, so this red outline is the columbia plateau in washington oregon and idaho and so get used to that figure that shape um, that was the analysis area for ali and so 
um, vast area, over three states, um, that was looked at. And here is um, a little bit of, of what ALI did. So we know that the natural world is not uniform, and even within an ecoregion, there's differences. And so um, that uh, Columbia Plateau was broken into canyons and channel scablands and Palouse grasslands and central basin, some of the stuff that, that Kurt mentioned. So we're looking at how do you develop a conservation portfolio? How do you capture these various targets and how do you, um, you know, ensure good distribution? And so one of the ways that it was stratified it was these, um, these subdivided targets within this landscape. We also looked at land cover. Um, we have a landscape that's um, natural and you know, has anthropogenic um, features across it. And we have everything from dunes to you know, Palouse Prairie to the wooded areas that are on the margins at the ecotones where we're getting more precipitation. And so we also, um, that also informed um, the look as to capture um, these, uh, helping us capture these conservation targets in a variable landscape. And then we had um, um, the targets that we narrowed uh, in on, uh, the physical targets of dunes and uh, woodlands and wetlands out in the shrub steppe and scablands and grasslands and rocks and um, cliffs and barrens. So there are species, you know, rattlesnake and, and bats use, um, you know, the clumner basalt, the fissures that are in them. And so we just have, um, we wanted to be able to put together a conservation portfolio that recognized these differences and captured these targets. And uh, what uh, ALI also did is it drew on existing um, uh, research that had gone on, uh, existing conservation efforts. We had the Washington Habitat Connectivity Working Group um, that had looked at the entire state of Washington and, um, and it looked at the Columbia Plateau and it looked at these core areas for certain species. So um, sage grouse were a were an ALI target, and they were also um, looked at in the um, connectivity analysis. And the two larger polygons are the one, um, you know, cover the area that Mike was looking at. But we had that um, connectivity, the core areas um, that were identified in another analysis help inform the ALI product. And so that, that was another feature um, that entered into the conservation portfolio. And we also looked at ownership. It wasn't done ownership blind. It was done with an eye towards, well, what areas, you know, who owns what, um, what areas already have some level of conservation status. And so um, that was um, another filter that everything was uh, run through. And, um, and so what resulted when we looked at um, those physical features and also um, the animal um, targets that we had was this um, suite of core areas, again, across three states, and looking at um, how do we best put together a portfolio that captures these, um, these areas of conservation. Now, it, this is not an attempt to um, conserve every single area where any species occurs. It was an attempt to, to look at where are some of the most important areas, the ones that are um, very central, that are the strongholds for species. And you see Mark San up top there. I'll just talk about Mark San for just a second because I think it helps give perspective about the, how that portfolio was developed. Is imagine a fixed uh, 30 meter pixel size grid across this three state area, and you have these conservation targets, you know, like shrub step and cliffs, and um, and deep soils for the uh, for the various uh, fossorial species, the the burrowing species and you uh, dunes and things like that and how are you going to in the most efficient way capture those targets and so um, if you have a in that fixed grid if you have three features being protected versus a, a grid pixel with just one feature um, being protected or captured in that then you would um, from an efficiency standpoint you'd pick the one that had the three features in it and so that's just a glimpse as to what was used to um, create these pixels. So I'll uh, have you focus on the polygon. The, there's a big polygon at the very top, and then the second one below it to the left. I'll just zoom in on that one a little bit. And that is um, uh, some of the features of that. It's 34% of the area for the Douglas County um, 
have a concentration area for sage grouse, that larger polygon is 34% of that. And overall, it's 17% of the HCAs for sage grouse of those multiple HCAs have their concentration area. So, and that's just a little bit, zoom in a little bit more, seeing that shape. So have that shape in mind. And another um, uh, resource that's available from ALI are these um, uh, scorecards. So we have these scorecards for all these, these polygons um, so to help you, what, you know, what, what does that polygon capture? What, what's in there? And so we can see it has high um, contribution to those ALI targets. You know, it's important for sage grouse. If you just look down at the little, um, at the legend, you can see like uh, the fifth one down is dunes. Well, that's NP, not present. So that's not capturing that feature in there. But you can go through this and all of these have these scorecards. So super helpful tool to help you understand why it's important and, and let you know about the features of that. And you look at the pie chart, you can see the percentage of ownership there. So all of the major um, HCAs or um, uh, PCAs, rather, uh, priority conservation area, have names, have a scorecard, and have uh, individual numbers. And so super helpful tool as a resource out there for, um, for shrub step conservation. And if you look at the little inset on the lower left, you can see where in the Columbia Plateau that exists. So really helpful to have these things. So that is um, just a, a nutshell of what's in um, ALI and how they got to their conservation portfolio and some of the resources that this fairly vast document provides. And this is the overall um, conservation portfolio with the core areas and, and the linkages. So we see the core areas and how um, central they are to the various um, you know how many of the conservation targets they contain and how they're linked and some of the links are are important for um how uh how um central they are there might be areas with one link and there might be areas with several links so and just really quickly here's the covers to some of the ali products again just to let folks know that these exist that they're out there and uh, and this has the this is the document with the um, scorecards in it and a couple of the analysis that it were referred to, um, the statewide analysis looked at wildlife habitat connectivity and the one on the right is the one for the Columbia Plateau. And so that was just a little bit more of a finer view. Um, you know, the statewide analysis, you know, help, we are using it um, for our work, even with the, the I-90 work where we have the, the wildlife bridges and we're also looking at where we do our work, having this sort of thing inform it. So this is a product out of the, the connectivity for the Columbia, um, uh, or the, actually the statewide analysis for, for um, Badger showing green being core areas and those red and, and uh, blue lines being um, some of the best connections, the least cause pass. And very briefly, uh, the SWAP, the State Wildlife Action Plan, one of the better acronyms that's out there, um, is something that Fish and Wildlife um, relies on. And uh, we have responsibilities for a multitude of species, and this contains species of greatest conservation needs. So over and above some of the more narrow targets that uh, occur in the connectivity and the swap. And it has these um, uh, lists of species that are closely associated with the um, various uh, ecological systems that occur. So it's a splitting of, of shrub step. So there's eight different types of shrub step in Washington and these really helpful cards in the swap show what species are generally associated and the ones that have asterisks are closely associated with with that habitat type. So if you have a, uh, an imperiled habitat type um, such as Intermountain Basin Big Sagebrush Step and you have a species that has an asterisk after it that's closely associated, that's something that's um, cause for concern. So how do we use these documents? So well, we, we, we try not to have them just, just gather dust on a shelf like so many studies have done. I want to implement them. I want to use them. I look at the connectivity analysis. I look at this Washington Biodiversity Conservation Strategy. I look at our SWAP. I look at ALI and look for reoccurring themes um, from these documents as to you know, what's a priority, where should I be looking, where should I be working. So here is the conservation portfolio from ALI. A recent project that I worked on west of Yakima and the Cowichi, uh, you know, identified this this polygon as a as an area to work on, uh, one of the one of the core areas. And looking in closer, just to just to get uh, an idea of the shape, 
and also ALI prioritized um, these polygons. So some were important, or, or all of them are important, um, because they're the byproduct of the overall analysis. But some are an urgent status, and some are our highest priority due to either uh, low distribution or threat. And um, and so this is some of the area that was conserved with the Kawichi watershed, sort of in the foothills of the Cascades. That was a high priority, and we, we had a 4,800-acre um, acquisition up there. And part of the reason we were working there was because um, these various studies showed the importance of this area. So we're using them. We're using them to implement our conservation statewide, and, and we want to make folks aware that uh, that they exist and are available to help inform their conservation work. Wanted to, I know Kurt emphasized it a little bit and, and Mike talked about it, but just wanting to talk about fire. Um, Jesse Gonzalez at one of our ALI meetings mentioned that if you're not working on fire, um, you're working on the wrong thing. And so just, you know, the devastating impacts of fire, because we have a smaller pie that we're working with. If you have the, in, you know, the entire Columbia Plateau is intact, and fires are less impactful, but when you have a smaller um, area um, with uh, that's widely, um, you know, it's fragmented, and um, these fires can be disproportionately impactful. And we have the cheatgrass element, so we have this exotic that's moved in, and um, and carries fire differently. So you you know the fuels are close to each other, and they also dry out, desiccate early on in the season, and so we have a longer fire season with a different type of fuel that really carries fire differently and so we're um, dealing with the impacts of that and I guess the silver lining to the dark cloud of the threat of fires that there is some legislation that we're working on with DNR and partners um, regarding making resources available to to um, help ameliorate some of the impacts of the major fires you know when you have 300,000 acres go up in a day um, impacting private landowners and habitat I mean that's a that's a big deal and so with that, I'll just put in a plug for uh, a video that we've come up with, um, working with partners and ALI folks. Um, it's called This Land is Part of Us, and it's uh, linked to it. It's available on WDFNW's website. And with that, I will turn it over to Hannah. Thank you all so much, Kurt and Mike and Mark. Really informative and excellent. Um, presentation of uh, the shrub step, I mean, all the way from the geology, all the way through the wildlife and to our conservation actions. Mark, can I ask you just to let go to, oh, there you go, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I'll take some, I'll try to facilitate some questions. I see a hand and if I can just, uh, David, would you like to ask a question? Um, yeah, first, a uh, really nice presentation, very educational. With the recognition that pollination is such an important part of keeping the plant communities together, what work has DFW done on looking at our native bees in this in, in these habitats? So native bees is the question. Do you want, I don't know, Mike, if you've been involved in the bee work at all or Mark, or I can give a, a quick Response. Well, what, you could probably do it. I mean, Ann, Ann uh, Potter has been out to actually train people how to identify these. So there actually has been a lot going on. Uh, some of our wildlife areas, for example, are planting stuff specifically to target pollinators. Um, there's a lot of work. It's one of the reasons why we're paying attention to things like swallowtail butterflies is because of the type of stuff we've been doing. Um, they're planting things for things like monarchs, uh, you know, and you got a lot of stuff going on because pollinators are a big deal. Um, just training people how to identify the different species of bumblebees is, is a start. Uh, and so people will actually pay attention to what's out there because a lot of what we've faced up till now is that people just aren't paying attention to some of those things. It's really easy to pay attention to something big like a pronghorn, but something like a specific species of bubble, bumblebee, not so much. Thanks, Mike. Mrs. Mark, Kurt, I'll just, I'll just ahead, sorry, I'll add that we've done some habitat work that has... Um, that has sort of run parallel with the bumblebee and identification and on several wildlife areas we've enhanced habitat for pollinators specifically with food plants that they utilize. Thanks Kurt. 
Uh, I see a question in the chat about how many acres were receded since the fire and what are the plans for the immediate future? Well, Kurt, do you want to take a stab at that one? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, so organizing this response to fire is a uh, full-time job plus, but so in terms of number of acres seeded, we have thousands, certainly, um, but an exact number to the nearest hundred, I'm, I'll even struggle to do. But let's say, let me see, we have, yeah, hmm. uh, with a mixture of aerial and broadcast seeding, a couple thousand acres, which is a drop in the bucket compared to what the total fire uh, footprint was. And I yep. imagine you're, you're mentioning our, those are our lands, WDFW lands, and may not be the, you know, private lands and That's right. partner lands. Mm -hmm. One of, I was just gonna throw something in here. One of the challenges is that seed is not always automatically available when you need it. So one of the things, uh, there were projects that were planned before the fires and those projects were modified to, a, to deal with the fires because the seed was already in hand basically or available. Um, but part of this challenge has been just coordinating the, the availability of seed for future plantings to make sure that whatever we need, we can, we'll have more of it the next planting season. Because the planting season for a lot of this stuff is in the fall. So the challenge of getting stuff planted in the short window between when the fires hit and when winter hit was, was pretty tough. But there's also been, there have been thousands of shrubs that have been planted as well that you really don't quantify in terms of acres. You quantify in terms of the number of shrubs planted and those amount to thousands because uh, quite a few of us have, have helped on plantings and a lot of those have been on private land, uh, not just on public land. So it's been fairly widespread given how little time we had. Thanks, Mike. And I'll just add quickly, Mark made a comment to it that we've been working in response to some requests from legislators about how can we, what can we do, and working on potential proviso for um, supporting uh, immediate actions to restore shrub step, as well as forming a coalition to our task force to look at how do we prepare for the future so that we can be better poised to um, respond to and restore um, when fire occurs. And so we're, you know, marching down that path of um, looking at that bigger picture. Uh, and I wanted to, uh, so Nate Pamplin put the link to the um, shrub set video in the chat. If you haven't seen it, please check it out. It's really well done. And thank you to our partners at Conservation Northwest and DFW folks for putting that together. Um, there's a question, uh, I see a couple um, questions in the thing, but I've got one in the chat. Historically, were large numbers of grazers that utilized the Columbia Basin shrub step that played a major role in natural disturbance, like what was present in the Western Plains? I think that's were there grazers like in the Plains? No, there were not. Dobbin Meyer covers that as do several other researchers. These plants didn't evolve with grazing pressure like you find east of the Rockies. Thanks. Jake, you've got your hand up. Yes, I'm a landowner assistance forester with the DNR, and I, I get asked a lot of questions on how to manage shrub step on private land. What resources are available for private landowners to manage uh, their property for one, fire mitigation, and two, um, habitat? Maybe I'll take that one quickly, uh, unless... Yeah, uh, so DFW does have a private lands program that is focused on doing exactly that. So working with private landowners to enhance their habitats for, um, enhance their spaces to benefit wildlife while also delivering um, uh, federal programs like farm bill programs or Mike mentioned CRP earlier. So um, please get in touch with us. We do, there are resources for private landowners and we're certainly interested in working with them. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ella. Thank you. I missed Kurt's presentation because I came in late and he may have touched on this already. But what is the uh, prognosis for areas that burn down to like 16 inches below the soil? What does revegetation look like in those hot burned areas? 
<laughs> um, well, it, it, uh, a fire of that kind is a is a landscape clearing event, and so really you need to reestablish seed um, or, or reestablish the vegetation from a mixture probably of seed to start with, and then plugs to follow. Uh, that is started plants, and and that's the plugs are generally forbs, but but especially uh, brush component. The grasses come back pretty well from seed. It can be done, but it's a lot of work. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, Robert. You've got your hand up. You just need to unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, here we go. No All problem. right. OK, so uh, my question, I came in a little late as well, so I'm not sure if it was discussed, but you know, the, you know, the old growth shrub, the, you know, the crypto gamut crust deal, um, how is there any prioritization towards preserving that those older shrub step kind of analogous to how we do with on the west side with the old growth forest? You want, Go ahead. I, mean, I, can, I can offer something. I mean, at, at this stage, we're trying to protect all the shrub step we've got. Uh, just to give you, I mean, there's a lot of examples of this, not only on our wildlife areas, but on private land as well. Uh, the Conservation Reserve Program is an example of a situation where we're trying to restore shrub step on, you know, old crop fields. But as part of that program in the past, one of the things we did to promote the preservation of these shrub step areas was to treat the, the fragmented areas as as though they had value to try to get people to think of those areas as being important. So even though they're small, to take care of them because the areas you're talking about, you can find them in really small patches of land and those cryptogamic crusts are extremely important, like you said. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. So we're um, at 12.59. I uh, want to wrap us up on time. It looks like we've um, captured most of the questions. And I really want to just thank you again, um, Kurt and Mike and Mark, for your excellent um, putting, you know, presentations and putting that information together in such a um, compelling way. And I'm really pleased, again, to the number of participants we had. A, I, I wrote down we had 249 at one point. So maybe 250 would have put us over the edge, but we'll never know. Uh, so <laughs> thank you again. Um, and I'll be distributing the um, recording to folks. So Thanks. have a great rest of your day. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, everybody. Excellent. Thank you. The replies are covering up my uh, get out button. <laughs> there. Team, team's purgatory. <laughs>